As we continue our Novena to St. Peregrine, let us say together the Novena Prayer. O great St. Peregrine, you have been called the wonder worker because of the numerous miracles which you have obtained from God for those who have had recourse to you. For so many years you bore in your own flesh the debilitating disease of cancer. I seek God's healing. Help me to imitate your enduring faith in the face of my great challenge, that I may trust the Lord as you did in your time of affliction, <clears throat> to find the strength to proclaim God's presence in my life, despite the anguish and fear this disease causes in me and my loved ones. O glorious St. Peregrine, aided in this way by your powerful intercession, I will sing to God now and for all eternity a song of gratitude for his great goodness and mercy. Amen. <clears throat> Recently a man came to see me who is suffering from stage four of cancer. He was diagnosed originally some years ago, then after treatment went into remission. So his cancer has now returned and he's undergoing extensive chemotherapy. And as you may know, chemotherapy is often unpleasant and exhausting. And he told me that all of his life he has worked hard for his family and obviously he cares deeply about them. And as an active and conscientious man, he finds he doesn't have the energy he once had because of the disease and because of the treatment. He can't do all of the things he once did, and as a result, he's begun to doubt his own value. As he said, I feel useless. His wife, obviously, dreads the thought of losing him and wants him to continue with the therapy at all costs, hard though it is on his system. And he continues with it, not out of a grim desire to hang on to life, but out of love for her and his family. Now those who suffer in this way are not without value. They give a powerful witness through their courage and their endurance. Now all of this, of course, raises questions of how we define a valuable and useful life. The related question is how do we define that elusive concept, quality of life? And then what is it to be human at all? The answer, as I've said before, comes to us in the face of Christ. He shows us what we were called and created to be and what we have made of ourselves. In John's Gospel, when Pilate brings Jesus out to present him to the people, he declares, Behold the man. So in his life and ministry, he has shown what true humanity is. So Pilate is making an unconscious reference back to the first man, to Adam. Behold the man, behold the true man. So he shows us what it is to be truly human, but the response of those to whom he was sent is to deface that image. And the passion scenes in John's Gospel place a question mark against all of our understanding of what it is to be valuable and worthy of imitation and emulation. Now what we see in the trials of Jesus before Pilate is the drama of a coronation, except that it's a parody of a coronation. Jesus is dressed in the pantomime, ro pantomime robes of royalty, the purple cloak, the reed as a scepter, and the thorny crown as the diadem. And he's brought out for the acclamation and acceptance of the people, as the emperor was in the past. But to the crowds, don't shout hymns of acclamation and praise, but they shout, crucify him. So rather than long live the king, it is kill him. So the throne into which he will be lifted is the cross. And the irony is, of course, is that this represents true power, the power of God. All standards of worldly utility and achievement are inverted by the revelation of the true king. Now those who suffer the burden of sickness enter in a special way into the sufferings of Christ. In chapter 21 of John's Gospel, Jesus tells Peter, after he has given him the commission to feed his lambs and his sheep, he tells him that in this act of nurturing, life will change. His life will be cut to the pattern of Jesus' life. Truly, truly, I tell you, when you were young, you dressed yourself and walked where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you 
and lead you where you do not want to go. Now, as we get older or fall further into infirmity, we all share in something of that experience. We lose something of our independence and freedom of action and freedom of movement. We become more dependent often on strangers who have to perform the services for us that we normally performed ourselves. And it requires a degree of humility in order to accept this as graciously as possible. So what we see in the passion of our Lord is humility. He through whom all things were made allows himself to be roughly handled, abused and humiliated by those who set themselves in judgment over him. He is stripped of his garments, forced to stumble to Calvary where he is crucified outside the camp, the object of pity, scorn and derision who all who pass by. For those who bring him to his death, he counts for nothing. He is without value. He can contribute nothing to their world. So the incarnation reverses our standards of value and usefulness. Now in England, when men of a certain age start reminiscing about their school days, one of the things that they talk about eventually is that time in elementary school when it was time for soccer. So a real rite of passage was when the teams were picked. So the co soccer coach didn't pick the teams, but he picked the captains who picked the key teams. And who were the captains? Well, the captains were always the athletic boys, the popular boys, the tall boys, and of course, usually they knew it. And if you lacked confidence or were not very good at sports, then picking teams was a nightmare for you and wasn't likely to increase your sense of self-confidence. Well, the team captains, if they were decent and fair and trying to give affirmation, would try and avoid humiliating the less gifted boys. But unfortunately, most of the team captains were not like this. That's why they were the captains. They wanted a winning team so that their own reputation would be increased. They didn't want losers. They wanted winners. A winning team captain is always popular. So the process of choosing would start. Each captain would take it in turns to pick a player. And naturally, they chose the more gifted ones first, or the ones who were their friends, or the ones who might be useful to them in some other way. So it was only the overweight boys, or the boys with thick glasses, or the nerds who were left to the end, because nobody really wanted them. They were useless. And these boys always tried to put a brave face on it, but you could tell that spending years with never being picked for anything could give you a kind of complex. Well, some people think that the journey of faith, the journey of discipleship is like that. You have to be picked for it because you are special. You have to be chosen for it because you are qualified. But so some people think not everybody then is chosen. Some are chosen because they're particularly good or gifted in the spirituality department. Others are not so well endowed and are not chosen. That's just the way it is. In fact, of course, it's not like that at all. When Jesus gives his disciples their missionary command at the end of St. Luke's Gospel, he doesn't say, go to the chosen few, don't go to the special ones. He doesn't tell them not to waste time on the losers, he tells them to preach the Gospel to all nations, to all. Now in chapter 20 of St. Matthew's Gospel, Jesus recounts a very puzzling parable. It puzzles a lot of people. He tells his disciples that the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers to work in his vineyard. And he found that he didn't have enough workers and that he had to go out again at nine o'clock noon and then again at three o'clock. And there was so much work that he still didn't have enough. So at the very last hour, five o'clock in the evening, he went out and scooped up the remaining workers who were standing in the marketplace. Just before and just after this story, Jesus has to clarify what being a disciple means. The first disciple he has difficulty with is Peter, Peter the leader, the team captain. He sees it as his right to exercise a kind of leadership role. Well, Jesus has said that the path of discipleship will not lead to riches or power or security. Indeed, it will be hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, Peter then begins to realize that all was not going to turn out as he had hoped and expected when he began his journey of discipleship. And he says, well, what about us? 
You mean none of this is for us? We've left everything to follow you. What are we going to receive? What's in it for us? Well, in the whole of this chapter 20, Jesus is mainly addressing Peter and then James and John. Well, these were the specially chosen. Jesus took them with him at special moments of revelation, the, mo the event of the transfiguration and the agony in the garden. They're what you might call the elect of the elect or the creme de la creme, the team leaders. Well, in response to Peter's question, Jesus tells this story about the laborers in the vineyard. Peter asks, what is in it for us? And Jesus tells this story to show how the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Now, in the verses after this parable, James and John, the other team leaders, even having heard this story, get their mother to go to Jesus and ask if he will give them the highest places of honor in his kingdom. Command that these two sons of mine may sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. She knows what she wants for her sons. She knows that they are the best amongst the disciples. She knows what they deserve. But they've not got the message. They've given in to the temptations of the trappings of leadership, to pride and ambition to a notion then of usefulness which doesn't apply in the kingdom. Now in the story, in the parable, one group of workers looks down on the others. Those called first look down on all the others. In the mother of the sons of Zebedee's request, one wants to climb over the others. So the mission is forgotten, or worse still, it's seen as a kind of personal support system. So what is this story in chapter 20 of Matthew's Gospel all about? Well, fundamentally, it's about God who goes out to summon people to cooperate with him in the mission. He goes out to choose people, but in the end, all are chosen. Matthew tells us that the landowner himself went out in search of laborers. He didn't send his steward, his foreman, or his overseer. He went out himself to call people, as Jesus, the good shepherd, goes out in search of workers. Our call to life comes directly from the Lord. It's a personal call addressed to me. It's not an anonymous invitation. It's not that for the Lord one is as good as another. The call is addressed to me, and there are certain things that only I can do no matter what my physical state. There is a word which only I can speak, a task which only I can perform, healthy or sick. So he makes a deal with the first laborers who are called. He says he'll give them a denarius a day. Well, a denarius was a good day's wages. It was more than fair. It would have been enough to sustain the laborer for that day and his family too, probably. And having called them into the vineyard, he then has to go and find others. And at regular intervals, he goes out and calls more all the way through the day until the very last hour. Now, many people have commented on this parable, and it seems to me that they misunderstand it. They take the question that the landowner asks of the last group literally. He asks them, why do you stand here idle all day? And it's the word idle that we get fixed on, because idle means labor, lazy. It means work shy as far as we are concerned. But in fact, the meanings, and this is how it's used in Ireland, when somebody is said to be idle, it means they are without work. So the question is, why are you without work? Why can't you work? So many people think that these are shirkers. While other better men have been toiling hard all day in the sun, they've been sitting in the town square taking it easy. And then the landowner comes along and sweeps them up into his vineyard and puts them to work, giving them in the end the same reward as all of the other workers. Now, some people have seen this as a story about the last judgment, the judgment that comes after death. As long as you repent, even if it's the last hour, then you'll manage to sneak into heaven. It may be a gamble, but you may be lucky and find yourself among the first in heaven, even if you were the last to repent. Well, the parable isn't about this at all. It's not about judgment, but about vocation. It's about service. It's about mission. It tells that these are for all and not just for the select or the experts or the well, the healthy. I didn't understand this parable until one day, very early in the morning, some years ago, I was driving through South London, on the other side of the River Thames. 
And there, there's a large roundabout. It seems to be endless with a whole series of traffic lights. And as I was stopped at these lights, interminably, I noticed that transit vans were drawing up by the sidewalk. And then men jumped out and walked amongst other men who were standing on the sidewalk. They looked them up and down and then picked some. You, you, not you, not you, you. And the ones who were picked got into the transit van and were driven off. But what I was looking at, it suddenly dawned on me, was a similar scene to the one described in the parable in Matthew's Gospel. The men in the vans were the foremen or the gangers, and they were choosing workmen who would work for the day on a construction site. They were day laborers. Now, if you were in the position of choosing day laborers, who would you choose? What kind of people would you choose? Well, you want to get the job done. You want to make sure that it's done as well as possible. So you choose the likeliest looking men who appear to be the ones who can do the job best. So it's like picking teams for soccer. You choose the best ones, the strongest ones first. Some will not get picked at all, perhaps, and will go home. And maybe they won't eat that day, and their families won't eat that day. In the 19th century English novelist's work, Thomas Hardy's work, Far From the Madding Crown, there's a scene which describes what used to be called a hiring fair. So on a certain day, market day, in the square of the market town, all of the agricultural laborers who were available for hire stood and waited to be employed. In this particular scene, amongst them was an old shepherd who spent all of his life looking after the flocks of the farmers round about. And life was harder for him now because he was old and employment was more difficult to find. He was becoming useless. Well, the farmers wanted younger, fitter men who were more useful. Now, this man had taken a great pride in his work. He knew more about sheep than all the others put together. But his self-respect and his own sense of identity were too bound up with work for him to accept that he was no longer employable. He could not accept he was useless. And without employment, the poor house was the only option. And Hardy describes how he stood in the marketplace all day and into the night. And he was still seen there standing with his shepherd's crook in the pouring rain. But nobody would hire him. Now in the story from Matthew's Gospel, you have to imagine a similar scene. The employer has gone out to find workers and he's chosen the fittest. But there are others. And these stay in the marketplace the whole day, some of them waiting to be hired and hoping for work. I suppose we're meant to imagine that these are the weaker ones, the less able, maybe the sick or the handicapped, but all of them still have families dependent on them. They need to eat and live themselves. There's no real suggestion they're reluctant to work. And when asked why they are not working, they, are, they say, because no one has hired us. It's not that they don't want to work, it's that nobody wants them. They are the unwanted ones, the valueless ones. And yet this landowner wants them. He sees that they still have a value. They can still help in the work of the vineyard. They may not be as fit and strong as the ones who were first called, but that doesn't matter. Strength and fitness brings its own reward. They have nothing to complain about. Even these weak ones, the ones whose contribution may be limited, have something to offer. They can still join in the common task. The ones who are called at the last hour are the ones who have endured the greatest rejection. And this was the story of their life. But the work in the vineyard, the work for the kingdom, would be incomplete without them. They are called two. There is a task which only they can fulfill. When the time comes for payment, they receive the same wages as everyone else. And it's then that the trouble starts. Those who've been working the longest, the 10%, those who were chosen first, want to change the terms of the contract. They think they have been undervalued. They have a higher sense of their own self-worth. But then, of course, they do. They are the ones who are used to being on top. They are accustomed to being chosen first. They are confident in their own strength and their abilities. Now, the landowner who gives the ones who come last a denarius, he ensures that they have enough to live on for that day and that their families will survive. He gives them their daily bread. So the landowner's generosity contrasts with the petty grasping of the stronger workers. He begins by paying the last ones to arrive on the scene their wages first. 
Now this makes perfect sense too. If you are the least able to work and yet you have worked hard, even for an hour, given what you could, it's quite likely that you would have been exhausted, worn out by this task. The landowner shows that he knows each of his workers personally. He, see each one, he sees each one as an individual and he knows the value of them all. And more than that, he shows, the Lord shows that he answers our prayers. When he teaches his disciples to pray, one of the things they're invited to ask for is their daily bread and everybody receives it. So here the landowner ensures that even the weakest and the most vulnerable will receive their daily bread. The denarius a day represents their daily bread. Now the lesson is clear. All of us are chosen for work in the vineyard of the Lord. All of us, sick or well, have a task to fulfill. We're not measured by the standards of value in the world, but the values of the kingdom. There are things which only we can do and words which only we can speak, no matter our condition. The vineyard of the kingdom is the world. We're sent out into the world with the life-giving message of the gospel. We are all picked for this team. It's not that some are chosen and others are not. We're all chosen. And it is the Lord who chooses us. He comes in search of us. All we need is to be ready to accept his invitation. You have to want to work. And he finds the task. So let us join together in our prayer to St. Jude. St. Jude, glorious apostle, faithful servant and friend of Jesus, the name of the traitor has caused you to be forgotten by many, but the church honors and invokes you universally as the patron of difficult and desperate cases. Pray for me who am in need of God's mercy. Make use, I implore you, of that particular privilege accorded to you to bring visible and speedy help where help was almost despaired of. Come to my assistance in this great need that I may receive the consolation and help of heaven in all my necessities, tribulations and sufferings, particularly. And that I may praise God with you and all the elect throughout all eternity. I promise you, O blessed Jew, to be ever mindful of this great favor. I will honor you as my special and powerful patron and encourage devotion to you. St. Jude, pray for us and for all who honor and invoke thy aid. Amen.